entertainment. And I know we generally don't think of like 1940s entertainment as pop culture, but it is. Hi there YouTube! Welcome to Vintagely Yours. I'm Chloe Jean, and for those of you who are new, and I know a few of you are, this channel is all about preserving, honoring, and remembering World War II civilian history on the American home front. And maybe it's wrong of me, but I've been trying to subcategorize 1940s life into four categories, one of them being entertainment. And I know we generally don't think of like 1940s entertainment as pop culture, but it is. It's just the pop culture of the era of our great grandparents and grandparents. So today's video, I'm going to take a look at the rather brief life of a jazz legend, um, Glenn Miller. So he was born Alton Glenn Miller in Clarendon, Ohio on March 1st, 1904 to a family that I get the idea was, wasn't too wealthy because they moved around a lot, ending up in Grand City, Missouri when he was 12. And he worked as a cow milker and swept out a butcher shop in town. And it's kind of unclear of how he got into music, but he was definitely playing trombone by age 12 because there is a bit of a dispute. Either he traded the mandolin that his dad brought him in for a trombone or the butcher he worked for gave him an old trombone. But we do know that he played, in addition to trombone, clarinet and mandolin. So once again, by the time Glenn is high school age, the family moves again to Fort Morgan, Colorado, where he enrolls in the town's high school and plays football and joins the town band. And he played football rather well because he wins the title of best left end in 1919. But he graduates at 17 because of his, where his birthday falls in the year. But he misses his own graduation ceremony because he's out playing at a gig. And his mom received uh, his uh, graduation diploma and is known to have said that she, she was worried that he wasn't going to make much of himself. And during his college years, it may or may not have looked like he was going to make something of himself because he dropped out after failing four out of five of his classes at the University of Colorado. And once that has happened, he decides that his real passion is music and that he's going to try his hardest to just become a professional musician and therefore he moves to New York. There is a bit of a gap, but 1926 finds him working in LA with a musician, Ben Polyok's band, and doing record deals with uh, Victor Young, who is a record executive. It's during this time that he's also writing compositions. He begins writing compositions and he writes what becomes Moonlight Serenade as Miller's tune. And then unfortunately his solos get cut during this time in the band so he decides that he's going to concentrate on composing music and let the band kind of be his source of income while he puts all of his energies in composing. 1928 is actually kind of a really big year for him because not only does he marry his college sweetheart, uh, Helen Berger, he also publishes the book Glenn Miller's 125 Jazz Breaks for Trombone. Also, he writes the tune Room 1411 and it gets recorded on the record Benny Goodman's voice. So now through the 30s, he just, you know, keeps composing, keeps working. Uh, he's in several different bands and arranges music for them and in 1935 he forms the all-american band for the British director Ray Noble and in addition to playing the clarinet in that band he also composes music for the them and he appears in a band in the 1936 film uh, the broadcast of 1936 uh, 
playing the song Why the Stars Come Out at Night. All of this arranging and being in a band and musical performances leads him to the decision that he's going to try to form his own band in 1937, which unfortunately does not gain enough popularity to become anything. So he has to give his band members their pink slips on New Year's Eve 1937, which really depresses him. So Benny Goodman has a talk with him and just says, stick with it, and he does. And he comes to the decision that he needs to set his wind section apart from other jazz bands. So he comes up with the idea, and I'm no musician, so I'm gonna butcher this. So he decides to have a clarinet play a melodic line of a song over four saxophones while the first saxophone plays the same note and the others support the clarinet in that first saxophone melodically. And he also hires the saxophonist Wilbur Shorts as his first clarinet player and that boosts the uh, band's popularity and they start to gain popularity. But the band also finds a sponsor and the business man Cy Shrimner and they begin recording uh, deals with uh, Bluebird recording in September 1938 and by the spring of 1939 they're making it big in New Rochelle, uh, New York and at their opening performance at Glen Island they have a audience of 1800. In 1939 Time Magazine reports that 6 out of 24 records that are being played in America Juice Box are Miller's music. The band plays in a concert among the jazz greats of Benny Good and Paul Whitman at Carnegie Hall on October 6, 1939. And Lynn gains even more popularity and notoriety by collaborating with Jimmy and Tommy A. Dorsey as well as arranging music for Bing Crosby songs and in starting in December 1939 his band actually finds a radio broadcast being sponsored in the form of the Chesterfield Cigarette Music Hour and they play three times a week Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night uh, for the radio program till September 1942 and it is immensely popular. Uh, Chesterfield cigarettes according to uh, the Times say that they've handed Glenn the Pulcher Pies for jazz and kind of what brings them popularity is for the first 13 weeks of the program the Andrew sisters who I did a video on I'll link down in the description and box so if you want to watch that one you can they were featured on the program 1942 is actually a really big year for Glenn because in February he receives his first gold record for Chattanooga Choo Choo 1941 uh, the band appears in the movie Sun Valley Serenade and then in 1942 they appear in Orchestra Wives which the public simply adored. They were contracted for a third film called Blind Date however that never actually happened because Glenn actually joined the military in the summer of 1942. So originally he is classed as what is known as 3A because he is 38 years old, wears corrective glasses, and is married, so that means he's unlikely to serve. But he really wants to modernize the military band to boost the morale of the military. So originally he tries to get in a commission with the Navy, but there's a lot of celebrity scandal revolving around enlistment, so he ends up being taken in by the army and ending up in the Air Force where he sets about forming uh, and revamping the military bands around the country and just before he ships out in 1943 to England he forms the Lynn Miller 
Air Force Orchestra, which joins him and joins him in England. And so in England, he gets his chance at boosting morale. In one year alone, he had eight, 800 uh, performances, 500 of them being radio broadcasts heard by millions and about 300 in-person and um, performances at concerts and hospitals and he even broadcasted in German radios at times. In 1944, in, in the latter part of that year, it is decided that the uh, band should go into Europe and by December we have gained a foothold in Normandy and so the Allies are in Europe and they need morale boosting because we've been fighting for at this point almost four years and so decided that the band should go do some morale boosting and they're gonna be headquartered in Paris uh, but there's delay after delay and on the Paris end and so Glenn starts getting impatient and he is scheduled to head over to Paris on the 13th of December but due to bad weather his, his flight for the 13th and the 14th are cancelled. By this time he's just so impatient he decides to hop a flight, a casual flight, which he's not supposed to do, on the 15th and that flight is piloted by Lieutenant Colonel Norman Basil and they take off about 1.55 p.m. and they are never seen again and nobody knows that they're missing until two days later because the Battle of the Bulge begins on December 16th, the day after the flight takes off and so the military is concentrating its efforts on that battle so nobody realizes that he's gone until the uh, 17th or 18th of December. And by this time, the band has flown to Paris and is getting ready for its Christmas performance in Paris. So it is discovered that Glenn is missing and they keep it under wraps for a little while because he's such a big prominent musician. And then just before the performance on the 23rd, Helen Miller is informed of her husband's disappearance on the 23rd at home in Tenafly, New Jersey. And the press is informed of his disappearance on the 24th of December 1944. The band goes on to play without him and throughout the war and into the 1950s. Of course, there is an investigation, and that investigation is undertaken by his second cousin by marriage, Orville Anderson. And it takes him quite a while to find out anything. But by January 1945, a year after his disappearance, it comes to light that the plane was lost over the English Channel due to three factors, which is human error, bad weather, and mechanical failure. So no one on that plane survived. So he is declared dead a year and a day after he uh, goes missing, which would be December 16th, 1945. And later on, Helen receives a bronze star for his service and he has a memorial marker in Ellington National Cemetery, which is actually one of the few places that he is known as Elton Glenn Miller. As I said, his band kept playing into the 1950s, as well as even today. So his legacy lives on, and I know that no vintage dance or reenactment is complete without one of his songs being played. I didn't actually know that much about his life uh, until I, of course, researched him. He was just that name and a musician. So I hope 
that you've learned something and if you're a Glenn Miller uh, music fan drop a line and down in the uh, comments section letting us know what your favorite song of his is and while you're at there don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you have Instagram don't forget to hop on there and like uh, follow me at underscore vintage Lee Wars 3945 and on Facebook which is a new addition uh, just I'm just vintagely yours on there. I am so looking forward to getting to know all of y'all. I will see you there on my social media pages and in my next video.